The Seven Wonders of the Ancient World by Edgar J. Banks The Pharos of Alexandria Please like this video so that more people have access to this content. Enjoy and also follow this channel to see other videos about art. The Pharos of Alexandria Off the coast of Egypt, where the western branch of the river Nile flows into the Mediterranean, there was once a small island of an oblong shape. It was scarcely more than a calcareous rock to which a thin veneer of soil had clung, and the soil was so saturated with the salt of the sea that little other than figs would thrive upon it. But figs flourished there wonderfully, and the natives, forgetting the ancient name Pharos, called the island the Garden of the Fig Trees. The surrounding sea abounded with reefs, threatening the approaching ships, and that is perhaps the reason why the island, lying as it did at the very entrance to Egypt, was never more than a haunt for the pirates who plied their trade along the coast. On the opposite mainland, less than a mile away, was the little Egyptian town of Rakotis, farther on beyond the town lay the large lake of Mariotis. In very ancient times, an Egyptian temple stood at Rakotis, and there, too, was a military station to protect the valley from the unwelcome stranger. Had the Egyptians been a seafaring nation, like the Phoenicians, Rakotis would have rivaled the great cities of Thebes and Memphis. In the year 332 B.C., Alexander the Great, made Egypt a part of his empire. Though that empire included nearly all the known world, it could hardly have been said to possess a capital, to build a city surpassing all others in grandeur and worthy of his royal residence was Alexander's ambition. There is a story told that one night in a dream an aged man appeared and advised him to select the mainland by the island for its site. In obedience to the vision, Alexander visited Rakotis and the island and decided that there the city should be built. The advice of the old man in the vision was good, for the little strip of land between the lake and the sea, with the adjoining island so well protected by nature, at the entrance to the richest valley in the world, and with a climate unsurpassed, was the ideal seat for the government of his world empire. With his own hand, Alexander marked out the boundary of the city by strewing flour instead of the customary lime along the ground. But the birds came and ate up the flour. It was not an unfavorable omen, so the diviner said, and again he marked out the boundaries of the city, larger than before. With him was Dinocrates, the architect. It was Dinocrates who proposed to carve Mount Athos into a huge statue of Alexander, a statue so immense that its left hand would have held a walled city, and through its right a river would have flowed. It was Dinocrates who was one of the builders of the temple of the goddess Diana of Ephesus, and it was Dinocrates whom Alexander commanded to build his new city. And the city of Alexandria was worthy of the great architect and of his royal master. It was fifteen miles in circumference, so the ancient writers say, and was surrounded with double walls, fragments of which remain to this day. Its streets were laid out in squares, and two great avenues intersecting at right angles in the center of the city were two hundred feet wide. Wonderful buildings were erected, royal palaces, temples where both Greeks and Egyptians met in worship, theaters, libraries, museums, and scores of others which were once world famous. The little island of Pharos in the harbor ceased to be an island, for Dinocrates connected it with the mainland by a causeway, or the Heptastadion, a mile long. Thus the harbor was divided, and even now the western harbor is the best on the Egyptian coast. Alexandria flourished. It attracted the trade of the old Venetian city of Tyre. Thither the Jews flocked in great numbers. 
it surpassed Carthage, and soon it became the second city in the world, acknowledging only Rome as a rival. It was the great center of trade, of culture, and philosophy. There was the famous Alexandrian Library. There, for three hundred years, the Ptolemaic kings of Egypt made their homes. The population was estimated at three hundred thousand free citizens and as many slaves, or it was half as large again as at the present time. But Alexander the Great was destined never to see the city that bore his name. No sooner had he commanded it to be built than he left it in charge of his viceroy, Cleomenes, while he marched away to conquer other lands. In the hot, marshy plains of Babylonia, the fever so prevalent there seized him, and on the night of June 13th, 323 B.C., tradition says it was during a drinking bout he died, or he was murdered. His body was carried in state to Alexandria, and in the Soma, as his mausoleum at the intersecting of the great avenues of the city was called, he was buried. Alexander's great empire was divided among his generals, and Egypt fell to Ptolemy. It was the same Ptolemy whom the title of Soter or Savior was later given for saving the island of Rhodes from Demetrius of Macedonia. It was he too who began the construction of the great lighthouse on the island of Pharos. He died before the lighthouse was completed, but his son, Ptolemy Philadelphus, during the years 285 to 247 BC, brought the work to an end. Unfortunately, the ancient writers have given us meager descriptions of the lighthouse, which they classed among the seven wonders of the world. Pliny, the Roman, who perished at Pompeii during the eruption of Vesuvius in 79 AD, has given the fullest early account. He says, There is another building, too, that is highly celebrated, the tower that was built by the king of Egypt on the island of Pharos at the entrance of the harbor of Alexandria. The cost of its erection was 800 talents, they say, and not to omit the magnanimity that was shown by King Ptolemaeus on this occasion, he gave permission to the architect, Sostratus of Snidus, to inscribe his name upon the edifice itself. The object of it is, by the light of its fires at night, to give warning to ships of the neighboring shoals, and to point out to them the entrance of the harbor. At the present day there are similar fires lighted up in numerous places, Ostia and Ravina, for example. The only danger is that when these fires are kept burning without intermission, they may be mistaken for stars, the flames having very much that appearance at a distance. It is a meager description, so brief that it teaches us nothing of the appearance of the tower. Fortunately, the lighthouse was still standing when the Arabs invaded Egypt in the year 616 A.D., they never ceased to admire it, and to weave legends about it, and their descriptions, sifted of the legendary, present a good picture of this wonder of the world. It was Ptolemy Soto who first conceived the idea of building a lighthouse, and for its site he selected the eastern end of the little island of Pharos, for there it might warn the approaching ships of the surrounding reefs. So Stratus of Canidus, its builder, was an architect of renown. The Arabs, however, who have always been fond of weaving the name of Alexander into their traditions, say that he built it, and that before he selected the material for its foundation, he threw stone, brick, granite, gold, silver, copper, lead, iron, glass, and all kinds of minerals and metals into the sea to test them. When they were taken out and examined, the glass alone was found of full weight and unimpaired, so glass was chosen. The glass, so the Arabs tell us, was shaped into the form of crabs, and upon them the lighthouse was built. As crabs of metal were used for the foundations of the obelisks which stood in the city, it is possible that the Arabs supposed that the foundation of the lighthouse was of a similar form. Perhaps the Arabs were correct in saying that the tower was built of the hardest tiburite white stone, 
embedded in molten lead and so firmly set that the joints could not be loosened. Neither the ancients nor the Arabs have given us the dimensions of the base of the tower. We shall probably never know them. Of its height, there are conflicting accounts, varying from 400 to 600 feet. The Arab writer Idrisi says, Its height is 300 cubits, taking three palms to the cubit, and so its height is 100 statures of men. Probably he was not far from correct. Unlike the modern lighthouse, which is usually a round tower resembling a single shaft reaching into the air, the pharos consisted of several stages, each smaller than the one beneath it. That each stage was of a different form is certain, yet it is only a tradition which claims that the three stories of the first stage were hexagonal, that those of the second stage were square, and all above were circular. The Arabs, who actually saw the lighthouse while it was still in a perfect condition, describe it as having four stages. The first was a square. Upon its summit, 120 cubits, or about 180 feet above its base, was a broad terrace, commanding a wide view of the sea. It was decorated with columns and balustrades and ornaments of marble. The second stage of about the same height, was octagonal. Upon its summit was a terrace commanding a still wider view over the sea. The third stage was circular, and it too was surmounted with a terrace. The fourth, which was open, consisted of tall bronze columns supporting the dome at the very top. There in the open space beneath the dome where the view out over the sea extended perhaps a hundred miles, were the lanterns and the fireplaces and the wonderful mirror to signal to the ships. The only decorations upon the exterior walls seem to have been the small windows to admit the light. Upon the base of the first stage was an inscription cut into the marble. It read, King Ptolemy, to the gods, the saviors, for the benefit of sailors. But if we may believe in ancient legend, the architect Sostratus was unwilling that the royal builder should long enjoy the credit of the construction of the tower. Sostratus, so the story says, first engraving his own name in the solid marble, covered it over with cement, and in the hardened cement he cut the royal inscription. In time, the cement crumbled away, and then the inscription, appearing in a new form, read, Sustratus the Canidian, to the gods, the saviors, for the benefit of sailors. Thus, the architect obtained all the credit due him, and more. Of the interior of the pharos, we know only the little that the imaginative Arabs have told us. A shaft reached from the foundation through the center to the very summit, upon which the fuel for the fires and the other necessaries were raised by a windlass. A spiral stairway, encased with marble slabs, encircled the central shaft. Above the second stage, the stairway and the shaft occupied the entire structure. The third stage, therefore, which was circular, was probably not far from twenty feet in diameter. Instead of a stairway, the Arabs tell us that an inclined plane led up the first two stages, and so gentle was the slope that a loaded horse might be driven into the highest of the chambers. It is certain that such inclined planes were built in ancient structures. One may now ride a horse to the gallery in the old church of St. Sophia in Constantinople. The vast space in the several stories of the two lower stages was occupied with chambers, yet neither their number nor their arrangement may now be known. One Arab historian says that they were more than 300 in number, and so intricately arranged that no stranger could find his way among them without a guide. Another, with still greater imagination, informs us that when a party of Moors on horseback entered the lighthouse, they lost their way, and coming to a crevice in the glass foundation upon which they thought the structure was built, many of them fell within, and perished. 
the purposes the chambers served we may only conjecture yet we are told that in some of them lived the keepers of the lighthouse in others were the storerooms and the lower ones may have been barracks for the soldiers but the greatest of the marvels of the pharos was the mirror on the summit to the conquering arabs it rather than the structure beneath was the greatest of wonders and strange are the tales they related of it there is a tradition that in the ancient egyptian town of rakotis was a dome on a pillar of brass upon which was a mirror five spans in diameter and perhaps that of the pharos was modelled from it the mirror of the ancients was generally of polished metal but as to the material of the pharos mirror the writers disagree one says that it was a transparent stone another calls it chinese iron or polished steel a third probably correct claims that it was finely wrought glass of its size we know nothing excepting it was so large that once when the arabs removed it they were unable to raise it back to its place nor is it strange that to the arabs the mirror was a marvel for they believed that to one standing beneath it ships out at sea far beyond the reach of the human eye were visible this story has led to the supposition that the mirror was shaped like a lens and that the invention of the telescope was anticipated by the architect Sostratus. It was said, too, that one might see in the mirror all that was passing in the distant city of Constantinople, the movements of the armies, the departure of the fleet, and that as the ships approached, the powerful mirror was turned to reflect the rays of the sun upon them and burn them while still in mid-ocean. Apart from the Arab tales, we may be sure that the mirror reflected the sun's rays farther than the eye could reach, a hundred miles or more out to sea, while the tower was still invisible. In Egypt, clouds seldom hide the face of the sun. Yet if the sun were invisible, from the fireplace on the summit of the pharos rose columns of smoke to guide the sailors, and at night the lanterns, like stars, sent out their less powerful lights. The cost of the construction of the pharos, so the ancients have said, was eight hundred talents. If the attic talent was meant, that was equivalent to about eight hundred and twenty-five thousand dollars in our money, but if the Egyptian talent it was twice that sum yet even that was a trifling amount for so stupendous a structure probably the labor was forced and the greater part of the expense was for the food of the workmen such was the wonderful pharos which in height was unequalled in the ancient world and which compares with the tallest of our buildings probably it towered into the air three times as high as any lighthouse of modern times there it stood, century after century, through the many changes in the history of Egypt. Alexandria prospered until only Rome was superior. The power of the Ptolemies passed away in the year 80 BC. Alexandria became a Roman city, and the names of Caesar, Antony, and Cleopatra were associated with it. Other centuries passed, and Alexandria became Christian. Rome declined. Yet the pharaohs, unaffected by time, proudly stood to rule over the sea. In Mecca, the prophet Muhammad was born. Like wildfire, his new religion spread over the world wherever his victorious armies marched. In 640 A.D., Amr, the great Arabian general, after subduing all Egypt, besieged Alexandria for fourteen months before it fell into his hands. Then he wrote home to the caliph Omar that he had taken a city of four thousand palaces, four thousand baths, four hundred temples and theaters, twelve thousand shops, and forty thousand Jews paying tribute. The great library had been partly destroyed during the siege by Julius Caesar, but it is said that two hundred thousand of the seven hundred thousand books it once contained still remained. 
the zealous Amr saw the great collection of books and exclaimed, If these writings of the Greeks agree with the books of God, they are useless and need not to be preserved. If they disagree, they are pernicious and ought to be destroyed. So the valuable old books of the library were used for fuel in the four thousand baths of the city, and they sufficed for their furnaces for six months. Still the light of the pharos shone, no longer to welcome home the ships of the Greeks, but of the Arabs. It seems that the Arabs, poor sailors that they were, still maintained the fires, and continued to relate strange tales of the mirror, tales such as Arabs can relate of the things they do not understand. Upon the pharos, so they said, stood two bronze statues, one of them raising its right hand with the rising of the sun, pointed to the fiery orb all day long, and only at evening, when the sun sank below the western horizon, did the hand fall to rest for the night. The other statue was even more marvelous. It stood silently, watching over the sea, and only raised its hand to point to the approaching enemy. Were the warning unheeded, and if the enemy drew nearer, the statue cried out with so mighty a voice that it could be heard for miles around to arouse the people to action. This tale, savoring of the Arabian Nights, seems to have no basis of truth, for it is doubtful if two statues ever stood upon the summit of the pharos. The wonderful mirror, constructed to aid the ships of the Greeks, finally caused their destruction. At least the Arabs said that whenever the bronze sentinel upon the lighthouse summit pointed to the Greeks approaching from the sea, and with its mighty voice gave warning to its Arab masters below, the mirror turned to reflect the rays of the western sun upon the ships, consumed them, and all on board with fire. The Greeks were in despair, for the statue and the mirror were against them and there was no longer hope of regaining the lost city. At length, during the reign of the caliph Al-Walid, a courtier of the Greek emperor resolved to destroy the pharos by stratagem. Laden with rich gifts for the caliph, he fled to Alexandria and professed his desire to become a Muslim. His gifts were accepted. Soon he was accounted one of the most faithful of the faithful, and a close friend of the caliph. No sooner had he won the confidence of the Arabs than he related tales of vast treasures of gold and of jewels buried in Syria. Thus he aroused the cupidity of the credulous caliph, who sent expeditions of treasure-seekers to Syria. The treasures, as the Greek had arranged, were found and brought home. The caliph's desire for hidden wealth was increased, and his Greek friend told him of more wonderful treasures buried beneath the pharos. To increase the faith of the credulous caliph, the priests were bribed to bring books telling of the treasures. At once Al-Wali dispatched troops to the pharos. The mirror was removed from the summit, and half of the lighthouse was torn down before the plot was discovered. The work of destruction then ceased, and when search was made for the treacherous Greek, it was found that he had fled in the darkness of night. The Arabs then restored the tower with bricks, but they were unable to build it to its former height. They sought to raise the mirror to the summit of their brick tower, but it was so heavy that they could not. Some say that in the effort the mirror fell and was broken to pieces. There is probably some truth to the story. The Arabs were never a seafaring people. Their ships were few, and they had little use for the pharaohs. With the wonderful magic mirror and the statues no longer to aid them, the lighthouse served their enemies rather than themselves, and the fires were no longer burning. In the year 875, Ahmed ibn Tulun had a wooden cupola constructed on the summit, and to it the muezzin climbed to call the people to prayer. So the pharos, or the minara, as the Arabs called it, became a minaret, and to this very day with every Muslim mosque there is a tower or minaret suggestive 
of the pharos of alexandria thus a new word was given to most of the languages of the world but the pharos which had already stood for a thousand years was not destined to continue for ever the wind blew its wooden cupola away to sea its foundation began to weaken and on the twenty eighth of december nine fifty five an earthquake threw down thirty cubits of its summit in nine sixty nine when the city of cairo was built alexandria was neglected for the new inland city however in eleven eighty two while the lower half of the pharos was yet standing to the height of about a hundred and fifty cubits a domed mosque was built upon its summit that the faithful might pray high up where the air was cooled by the breezes from the sea in thirteen seventy five when another earthquake visited alexandria only the lower stage of the pharos survived and that badly shattered soon fell to a heap of ruins in fourteen ninety eight when the passage around africa to india was discovered and the ships began to pass that way another blow was given to alexandria the city declined the ruins of the pharos gradually disappeared or were used in the construction of a mole in the harbor and the site where it stood was forgotten excavations in alexandria are attended with many difficulties for most of the ancient city lies buried beneath the modern houses the entire egyptian coast has subsided and some parts of the city are now covered by the sea the causeway or the heptastadion which dinocrates built to connect the island with the mainland has grown with the sand washed up by the sea until it is a half a mile wide it is now thickly covered with houses its outer end is known as the pharos or Kayat Bay, but all that is left of the island is the quarter Ras et Ting, where the palace of the Khedive stands. In 1898 to 1899, a German expedition sought in the sea for the foundation of the Pharos, but in vain, for the end of the island where it stood has been entirely weathered away. Only in the modern mole are there great stone columns which may have come from its ruins. A modern lighthouse, well worthy of the present Egypt, stands nearby, yet it is insignificant when compared with the pharos, which was the wonder of all the ancient world, and the like of which no modern man has ever seen. End of chapter 7 End of the Seven Wonders of the Ancient World by Edgar J. Banks We hope you enjoyed this video. Please let us know in the comments what other art contents you would like to see. And don't forget to like this video and follow our channel. Thank you, and until the next video.